So Polkadot has really rocketed lately, overtaking Ripple as the number three overall crypto coin, excluding Tether. Now, Adrian already made an overview video about the Polkadot project, but that was more so on the informational and educational side. And in this video, I want to go back to my roots when I used to do a Real Talk series, if any of y'all remember, where I cover the pros and the cons of various projects with no shilling nor FUD. So this might be interesting to you if you're already a DOT investor or you've been thinking about it. So you know what to do, just sit back, relax, and just keep on watching. Welcome back to Bitcoin for Beginners. I'm your host, Kevin, and in this channel, we're all about deep research, honest opinions with no frills nor fluff. As always, I leave timestamps down below for your viewing pleasure, and please like and subscribe if you want dots to go to the moon, but you're also to consider some hurdles and fair criticism. So just a really brief overview and recap of what the Polkadot project is all about. It's a second generation blockchain protocol aiming to improve on the first generation ones like ETH 1.0, and it's been focused on interoperability and scalability from the get-go. That means you can run dApps, smart contracts, and just send regular transactions much faster and cheaper. And because of the interoperability aspect, it can also coordinate and work with other apps and tokens from other blockchains. It has a really unique architecture. It has the main Polkadot blockchain they call the Relay Chain, and that uses a consensus mechanism, NPOS, or Nominated Proof of Stake. Per testing done in 2020, last year, it can handle up to 1,000 transactions per second, which is super fast compared to some other ones out there. They also have multiple parachains, which are like blockchains that other people can create and customize for their own use cases. And those all connect and feed transactions to the main relay chain as necessary. That's what makes it so scalable. And lastly, in terms of the architecture, they have bridges built in between polka dots and other big blockchains out there. So that's pretty useful as well. They raised almost $2 million from their ICO in multiple rounds selling the DOT token. And it was founded by Gavin Wood, who is a famous co-founder of Ethereum and some other high profile people in the blockchain space. Gavin also founded Parity Technologies, famous for building the Parity wallet, which did face a high profile bug, which caused a lot of their ICO funds and other teams as well to get locked up forever and inaccessible. So in this video, like I said, I'm going to cover both the pros and the cons. Let's start with the bear case. And this is not because I'm a polka dot bear, but I just thought it'd be more interesting to start this because you guys probably know the reasons to be bullish about polka dot already, right? You don't need me to tell you that first. Please don't take this as me trying to hate on Polkadot because that's not true at all. But let's have a chat about these. And if you think some of these are unfair or that I got it wrong, then please let me know down in the comments below. And I'd love to update my understanding about this because, you know, things move fast and info that I research and see isn't necessarily the most up to date by the time you're watching this. And so I may be operating off of old info. Anyways, the first point I want to cover is more of a high level philosophical question, right? And that is their core philosophy for Polkadot. Is it right or wrong? Gavin Wood said that Polkadot is the biggest bet against chain maximalism out there. And I'm not necessarily a maximalist, even though I love Bitcoin and Ethereum. But the big question is, will there be useful stuff built on all these hundreds or thousands of different chains that Gavin envisions, right? I mean, just look at the stats. A lot of projects are pretty much non-existent in terms of transactions. A lot of spam ones that are just reimbursed by the projects themselves, maybe. And also a lot of them are bleeding developers. The ones who joined in the last macro cycle have since left. So if it does end up just being a smaller number of survivors and true blockchains that capture most of the value, then maybe they wouldn't need something like Polkadot to work with each other and they can just build direct bridges from one to the another, right? That's just my personal open-ended question about how the space will mature in the future. And number two point I want to bring up is Polkadot does brand themselves as interoperable and playing nicely with all the other projects out there. But let's be real here. There still is going to be competition for limited attention, adoption and resources to build natively on different chains because they do have overlap with other projects. Right. And that means that they'll have to compete for adoption amongst the builders and developers. So the first point for this is, can it beat the network effects of Ethereum, especially with ETH2 coming along? 
right? I mean, Polkadot is more scalable and more interoperable right now. And that may last for maybe a year or two more until ETH2 gets fully rolled out. But if performance was all that matters, then all the developers and builders would have migrated from ETH to EOS. And as we can tell, that has not happened, right? EOS is like a zombie project right now. Besides Ethereum, a lot of other well-funded projects with stellar teams and novel design spaces are coming out as well, right? We got Nier, Solana, Cosmos, Ava, Hashgraph, Tezos, and much more. They all have a lot of overlap with Polkadot, even though theoretically Polkadot can work alongside them and complement them. And so can Polkadot attract more of the builders and the projects and the apps to come onto their ecosystem first and foremost? That is a big question. I don't think it's going to be a walk in the park, right? To get all this adoption just because they claim to complement and play nice with all the other projects and teams out there. The third point is that there's not that many validators out there yet. At time of shooting, I believe there's around 297 validators operational and many of them are run by the same entities, right? You can take a look at the list at polkadot.js.org and Zug Capital and P2P.org run a big chunk of them. And so with that, there's a risk of collusion, right? I mean, we saw this going on with whales and block producers in the EOS space. And I'm not saying that this is the same exact case, nor that it's going to turn out the same, but it is a general point of concern. And they just need to make sure to get this right because it's super important and to adjust as necessary if they don't have it right from the get go. On chain governance is still experimental in and throughout the crypto space. So that is something to keep an eye on too. And the last category of concerns or cons per se is that there are some interesting architectural design choices when building the Polkadot system that I have some questions about, about if it will turn out well, right? And these assume you know a little bit about Polkadot, but if you don't, then just feel free to take what I say and go direct your research in those areas. The first part is that there are going to be a limited number of parachains, which is like their side chains or the blockchains that feed all into the main Polkadot relay chain. It's limited by the amount of validators overall. And currently they're saying that they're hoping to achieve about 100 parachains. Now I know Gavin came out and said that in the future they can exceed the limit easily of a thousand validators and a hundred parachains. But let's talk about the now and the tangible because that's all that we can judge and evaluate currently. So of the 100 parachain slots, about a quarter to a third are going to be reserved for system parachains and the rest are going to be up for auction or used for para threads, which are like mini side chains per se. Now to get these from auctions, it is permissioned. So this can lead to a risk of centralization if they don't want to let a certain project on or they don't feel like it's useful potentially and that can get excluded. And also I want to note that if a parachain ends up losing its slot eventually, because it's not forever, you have to have a leasing period, then they can turn into a pair of thread, but those don't have as high up capability and guarantees as a parachain. So that may not work for whatever application or use case that's currently running on that parachain. Now for the auction period, you have to lock up dot and wait for the auction to conclude before you can potentially get it back. And that is a problem because people have to lock up a lot of DOT and wait while holding this volatile asset before you can see whether or not you get your slot, right? And so many developers too might not have the capital to do so. That may hinder the amount of experimentation that can go on in the Polkadot ecosystem. Like for example, with Uniswap, if you don't know in the Ethereum space, some guy, some developer was just working on this for two months on the side by himself and that became Uniswap. Would he be able to get all the capital necessary to do an auction and win a slot? Maybe not, right? But they are working on some crowdfunding mechanisms and whatnot, but this is really important to get down correctly. And also, like I mentioned earlier, Polkadot runs off of on-chain governance. So if you have a lot of tokens, you can get involved with making decisions for the whole network, right? So this can be a problem because this means that they may have centralized council decision makers. They're going to have a council of up to 24 people. And this can be a centralization risk for the whole network because they can veto changes to the network and proposals too. And there's still a lot more rules to be ironed out, but this could lead to collusion between these council members, right? Or signaling risk. And that means that you don't really know what's going on. There's an important decision that involves all DOT token holders, but you're like, hey, this top council member voted this one way, so I'm just gonna follow forth. I don't really care what it is. That's not gonna bring out the best results. Another interesting design choice is the inflation. Right now there's about 10% inflation. 
So even if you're getting a lot of returns, that may put more sell side pressure because the supply is increasing quickly. In comparison, Ethereum is currently at around 4.3% per coin metrics data. Last but not least, in these curious design choices, Polkadot is not as composable currently as the Ethereum's approach because if you want to launch your application on some pair chain, you'll need to have the existing functionality on some other pair chain or the one you're launching on in order for it to work, right? Like, for example, if you're building a dApp and you want to build it on top of the functionality of another dApp, you'll need something to exist in the Polkadot ecosystem already or bridge over, I guess. Composability is a huge aspect of why we see so many new projects going out in the DeFi space. And the question is, is Polkadot able to support this spirit of building on top of each other or is there going to be a chicken and egg problem like should someone build this first i can't build x yet because i don't have y there available yet so who's going to build y first right that's a big question so we talked about the bear case but like i promised there's a lot to be excited about in the polka dot space too it is definitely one of the most promising gen 2 blockchain projects out there so the first thing I like about it is that it's built with a clean slate and intentionally designed, right? It was said that Gavin started Polkadot because he couldn't wait so long for Ethereum to adopt sharding and other similar techniques. So this is a big benefit, right? Because Ethereum has to carefully manage migrating its existing chain and all the value already on there instead of just importing that over to the ETH2 network. Polkadot, on the other hand, can just move fast and experiment fast in their nascent phase of their own network without breaking too much if something isn't right immediately. And on the topic of moving fast, they also have been launching on schedule in a really brisk manner, right? They launched Kusama, a handful of other test nets. Their main net was launched in 2020. The treasury is live and actively approving proposals. And they have a large percentage of circulating DOT being staked for validators, which is really impressive. Substrate 2.0, which is their framework for building blockchains and apps for the Polkadot ecosystem, was also released recently. And I just give them really big props for hitting their release points and their milestones in an age where other blockchain projects are always about delays, delays, and more delays. Next, their team is composed of really great blockchain veterans, right? We got Gavin Wood, who was the co-founder of Ethereum. No more need to go into his background. Then we got Robert Habermeyer, who is a co-founder as well. He's also a Teal Fellow and focused on the consensus protocol that powers Polkadot. And then we got Alistair Stewart, who is the research lead for Polkadot and also very well known in and around the blockchain space even before he joined this project. The next area to be really bullish about Polkadot is that they have a lot of things and projects being launched on Polkadot. You can check out the Polka project site, which tracks everything getting built on there. You got stuff like Chainlink building an Oracle's pair chain. This is the first chain they're building on post Ethereum. And then you got Ocean Protocol, 0x, Plasma. You got over 100 teams and projects and growing by the month of teams getting involved and working in the Polkadot ecosystem, which is awesome. And the last bullish case is about their design considerations, right? I said some negative things or critical things, but there's also great things about it too. I like their shared pool of security approach. That means that all the pair chains or side chains per se that are built on Polkadot share the security with each other and focus just on building great functionality for the pair chain rather than putting more burden on them for providing security for their chain. So with this model, they don't have to attract miners, validators and so forth, they can just focus on building a great customized parachain for their particular application. I also really like how they intentionally have bridges. They're building bridges between Polkadot and Ethereum and Polkadot and Bitcoin and other ones too. But this is great to help interact and facilitate value exchange between Polkadot's ecosystem and the two biggest ones out there currently. I'm also a big fan of the Substrate framework that lets developers easily create their own blockchain, right? This is a plug and play modular framework where you can choose functionalities out of the box and customize it to your own needs. What you built using Substrate, you can connect to Polkadot or be its own blockchain, but it's trivial to connect to Polkadot if you want to because Polkadot itself is built on Substrate. So as you can imagine, anything else built on Substrate works seamlessly with Polkadot its relay chain and main structure. Lastly, in terms of the inflation that I stated earlier, the lion's share of dot inflation goes back to the validators and stakeholders, right? So right now, because we're more than 50% participation, 100% of the inflation is going towards rewards to the validators for securing the network. But that's it for the bull case and the bear case. What do you think, right? In terms of my final thoughts, I have nothing but the utmost respect for the Polkadot project 
And would I bet all my coins and money that this is going to capture the most value in the crypto space in the long haul, like multiple macro cycles later? Not necessarily, but then again, I'm not that confident in any specific project out of all of its competitors either, right? Let me know what you think. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about my pros and cons. And if you like this type of video, this real talk episodes, then please like and subscribe. I'm Kevin from Bitcoin for Beginners. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day and I'll catch you guys next time.